Welcome to Al Bernstein Unplugged Unboxing. In a 40-year Hall of Fame career, Al has chronicled some of the greatest moments in boxing history. On this podcast, you get to hear him expand on those memories and talk about the current news in the sport of boxing. You also hear Al interview some of the biggest names in the sport. Here's Al Bernstein Unplugged. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode, one in which we are going to visit with Leo Santa Cruz, uh, who will be fighting on October 31st against Gervonta Davis in a big uh, Showtime pay-per-view down in uh, Texas, where for the first time fans will be in attendance, socially distanced appropriately, but uh, in attendance nonetheless. And um, so we're going to we're going to chat with Leo a little bit later, and we're also going to answer uh, several of your questions and chat about the sport in general. And to help me do that, my co-host, uh, Mr. Trip Mitchell. Trip, how you doing? I'm doing great, Al. And uh, the idea of having a, a small amount of fans in the Alamo Dome is interesting because you and I have done televised fights where we had small amount of fans, but it wasn't because of social distancing. It was because yeah. of poor promoting. <laughs> yeah, or or a small arena that couldn't that couldn't handle more. Yeah, um, that that's going to be intriguing. Uh, but I think it'll still add some element of of excitement, certainly. Uh, and and obviously the need to social distance is uh, paramount uh, to make sure that it's it's safe. Uh, and uh, it'll be interesting. And the Alamo Dome, of course, is a you know a cavernous place, so uh, it seats what. 80 some thousand people, I think. Uh, and so uh, I, I'm not sure where they're going to cap the crowd at, but um, they'll do it based on what they think is, uh, you know, is a safety factor. What's your favorite? If, if you had the best fight in the world in any arena, do you like doing the big, you guys go over to Wembley now with 80,000 people. You've done fights all over with that many people. Or would you rather be in like a, a smaller building with just, much more energy. What's your favorite? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, some, it, you know, it's like I did uh, college basketball for ESPN uh, a couple of years, and I did uh, part of the time I did the Big Sky Conference, where you were in smaller gyms that were packed with people, and uh, and then I did a couple of games that where it was in larger arenas, uh, in uh, in a, a couple of the bigger conferences, and. They each have their own excitement level because when you're there with 90,000 people, as we were for the Klitschko Joshua fight, you know, it's, it's, uh, it takes on a life of its own. It's extraordinary. And yet a small venue that's packed to the, to the hilt, um, you know, that, that, that where you can, the energy is palpable and you feel everybody is right there with you. Um, is also exciting. Probably the most ex exciting crowd experience that I've ever had in announcing a fight was when we did the Ricky Hatton Costa Zoo fight at the MEN Arena uh, in Manchester. Uh, and, and, I, and I had been there also for uh, Joe Calzaghe and Jeff Lacey, which was a close second for, uh, especially in European fights. But um, that was a uh, very exciting experience as well. Who are the craziest fans in the world? What nationality? Uh, fans in Massachusetts that have had a lot to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Cape Cod we, Coliseum. Early in our early in our uh, top rank boxing series, we did a lot of fights. A lot of them involving Mickey Ward, ironically, uh, and of course Mickey had his share of uh, drama, just family wise. Um, and the fans there, uh, they just would. You know, they, especially when they imbibed a little bit, they were given to uh, being uh, kind of nutty. Uh, one, at one point, uh, we were doing, this was early in my career, we were doing the open, and the crowd really wanted the fights to start, and they saw us standing there, um, and this the group of fans right in front of us, or a little bit in front of us, was really angry, and they started screaming at the top of their lungs, you suck, you suck, you suck, right at us, you know. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I was, you know, taken aback. And uh, Sal Marciano looked at me and he said, yeah, it's going to get worse over the years. This is, this is nothing. So, yeah. well, but anyway, so they, you, those fans. You guys learned a lesson, pretty... never do fights at Harvard again. Pardon? Never do fights at Harvard again. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Those Harvard students were very unruly. 
So during the course of the fights, we always hear about CompuBox. That's a service that really yeah. helps out by counting the can you counting the punches, power, and that sort of thing. Can you talk a little bit about how that helps broadcasters out? Yeah, CompuBox was uh, started many, many years ago by uh, Bob Kenobi and our friend Logan Hobson, uh, and um, and it. It is a service that is widely misunderstood, I think, in many respects, because the purpose of CompuBox was not to tell you who won fights. It was to provide uh, the broadcast with another tool that it could use to uh, enhance their coverage of the fights. And uh, I was in on CompuBox early because they worked with the ESPN Top Rank Boxing Series. Uh, uh, in the 80s, and uh, while they also did HBO fights, and now, of course, that group works with us at Showtime doing show stats, and they work with uh, many of the other uh, broadcast outlets as well. And what it is, is that the way they devised it, one person counts the punches of one fighter, and another person counts the punches of the other fighter. Um, so they're, a person is focusing in on one uh, on one fighter. And um, it's broken down into categories as the fans see at home, you know, whether it's a jab or a power punch, which is everything other than a jab. They also now have broken down to body punches, which is great. That's very effective. And I've always thought it was an effective tool to use to point things out in fights. Um, Bob Canobio, interestingly, is on the ballot this year for the Hall of Fame, the Boxing Hall of Fame, which demonstrates completely how mainstream it is and how much it's been accepted because you can't be more mainstream than uh, being on the ballot for the uh, Boxing Hall of Fame. And by the way, uh, the Hall of Fame voting this year is really, really hard because uh, while you get to pick five uh, fighters on your ballot in the in the main category, the modern category, you there will only be three fighters more than likely that will be uh, selected. Now here's here's a real dilemma on the ballot this year among others of Vladimir Klitschko, Floyd Mayweather, James Tony, Andre Ward, Rafael Marquez. Um, and a number of other great fighters. So you can already see that if only three people can get on, just the first four people I mentioned, you have Klitschko, Mayweather, who of course is a lock, um, James Tony, and Andre Ward. Now among those four, you know, they're all Hall of Famers and, and no will all be in the Hall of Fame. The question is, will they be in on this ballot? Yeah, and personally, I think Andre Ward would be our favorite in many respects. Well, yeah, I think Andre Ward deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. But then, you know, so does James Stone and Vladimir Klitschko. So, uh, and I, 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 they're all three of them. Mayweather's a lock, so we know he's going to get in. And then Rafael right. Marquez is not far behind all of them. But, uh, yeah, I, there's no question Andre Ward deserves to be in. But, uh um, you know, as I said, so do Tony and uh, Klitschko. So now there is, I think, a, a rule where if somebody gets 80 percent of the ballots, they could put on another person. Now, in this case, that may well happen because I can't imagine a ballot that is turned in that doesn't include those four people that I just mentioned. Now, all the rest of the people will be fighting it out for the other votes. But Anybody that fills out a, a ballot for the International Boxing Hall of Fame that does not include Tony, Ward, Klitschko, and Mayweather, you know, should lose their voting privileges. Exactly. And by the way, a Easy complaint about our, I, by the way, we have a complaint about our on site producer in Vegas. Uh, I asked him very nicely about writing a song for us, and he brought up the term the Golden Girls. Can yeah. you uh Right. My son, Wes, was, who helps us with the uh, with the technical parts here. And of course, people know he's a singer songwriter and has written over 100 songs. And you rightfully asked for that. But um, he could have said friends, couldn't he? I I was thinking it. But uh, you and I dancing around a uh, a water feature, not going to get our viewership up. Let's go to the questions. 
Brad Cooney wrote, Hi, Al. I'd like your thoughts on Wilder releasing Mark Breland and whether or not you think that's the right move. Yeah. By the way, Brad is a very talented uh, gentleman who does his own boxing broad, uh, podcasts and uh, writes about boxing. And uh, he's so he's a very knowledgeable uh, person when it comes to the sport and a delightful guy as well. Uh, so this is a really interesting and sticky question uh, and comes at a time when now Tyson Fury, we just learned the other day, he told the Atlantic, or the Athletic, not the Atlantic, excuse me, that he is thinking of bypassing the Wilder fight, that Wilder and his people didn't make a deadline uh, that they were supposed to make for uh, having, you know, something in place. It was supposed to be on December 19th. Now they're talking about because of conflicts in the U.S. with other sporting events, they want to push it back. You know, Fury's not, it's already been pushed back because of Wilder, you know, because of injuries, et cetera, and the pandemic. And uh, Fury is not too keen on having it pushed back again. And when they missed the deadline, that kind of gave him a reason for uh, suggesting that he may move on and, and he may very well have a fight in England, go home and he hasn't had a fight in England for several fights, and then move on to a fight with Anthony Joshua, uh, which, of course, would be a monstrous uh, fight. And that would leave Wilder to uh, to try and um, pick up the pieces in a different way. And then, as Fury said, let him get a couple wins, then we'll do it all over again. Uh, as it relates to the, the, the uh, letting go of Mark Breland, clearly we know that was a, you know, an offshoot of Mark Breland stopping the fight, throwing in the towel when uh, he was fighting Fury. And the word is that Malik Scott, who is a heavyweight who actually fought Deontay Wilder uh, and was a very good sound technical heavyweight, though he never reached championship level, that he is going to join JD's as the co-promoter, a co-trainer of, uh, of um, Deontay Wilder. And that was an interesting choice. He has worked with them before and, uh, and, but he's never been on that level as a co-trainer or lead trainer for someone. So many people believe that, you know, Mark Breland was, became kind of a scapegoat for uh, the loss, whether that's true or not, only Deontay Wilder and his people know. Uh, there's no question Mark Breland is a very talented trainer and knows his way around uh, a boxing ring. And I hope Mark, uh, gets additional opportunities with other people. Yeah, and when you have a loss like that, there are scapegoats. Yeah, the oftentimes now, especially changes are made, uh, especially in this day and age. You know, um, boxers change trainers like we change suits. You know, it just it happens a lot. Yeah, and and the old days, you just didn't see that. You had continuity, which was no, probably and you nice know, to see. That, that was good and in a way maybe bad because sometimes you might need fresh blood. But um, overall, continuity, you know, seems like a better way to go if you can do it. But uh, And, of course, he was with Mark Breland uh, for a long, long time in his career. Um, so it's not as if he – it was a, a decision made, uh, you know, after a short period of time. And he has a right – Deontay Wilder has a right to have anyone he wants training him. So uh, it's his prerogative, certainly, to make a change. Okay. Uh, from the Sweet Science, how do you uh, – oh, first of all, let's go up to stacks here. Can Leo Santa Cruz beat Tank Davis? Yeah. Um, yes, he can. Uh, he's the underdog, and rightfully so. Davis is a very powerful puncher, and – certainly the most powerful puncher that Santa Cruz has faced. Leo has come up from 118 pounds all the way to 130. Davis uh, fought his last fight at 135, though he'll have to fight this one at 130. And Davis is more of a legit 130-pounder. Uh, Santa Cruz, just I think, just has the one championship fight at 130. And so that's a big bugaboo, the power of, uh, of Davis. However, the way that Leo Santa Cruz can win is if he, he says he has to fight almost the perfect fight. And that may be true, but if he uses his height and reach and does his volume punching and keeps Davis at bay uh, 
and gets him into the later rounds, um, there's he can get the job done and win a decision in this fight. Fantastic. And our final question, the sweet science. How do you see the Lomachenko-Lopez fight unfolding? Yeah, we had a, a, a very nice interview with uh, Tiafimo Lopez that uh, if you have not seen it, uh, please check it out. Um, in which uh, Tifima Lopez, uh, I, I thought, revealed himself to be a very thoughtful and interesting young man. Uh, inside the ring, he is an explosive young man uh, as a puncher. And that fight is one of the most anticipated, I think, of the last several years in the sport of boxing. Again, in a, a kind of similar theme, I think the, the first six, seven, eight rounds of that fight are the rounds in which Tifima Lopez could be very dangerous to Lomachenko. Uh, and the longer that fight goes, I think the better it is for Lomachenko, even though I, I'm not suggesting Lopez can't do 12 rounds or even be effective, but Lomachenko is just a master boxer. Um, and what, what we don't know, and we haven't really seen Lopez get hit by a, uh, you know, a, uh, a top, uh, Lightweight Richard Comey, who would have tested him, never got to hit him because uh, he knocked Comey out so quickly. And so, can Loma hurt Lopez? It's possible. Loma is a, a good puncher. Uh, he's not a one punch knockout artist, artist, but he has many stoppages and he can punch well. So, uh, uh, I think what's going to happen is Loma is going to try and uh, box those early rounds, still put his punches together. And uh, Lopez is going to be looking for something in the first four or five rounds to at least hurt Lomachenko with and let him know, hey, I'm the bigger puncher in this fight. Um, and I, once we, you know, if we get to round seven and eight, it's going to be very interesting. That's for sure. Uh, and I, you know, I don't have a prediction in that fight. I think it's a pick em fight. And I think that it's going to be one thing I know is it will be dynamic uh, because Lopez is looking for a knockout. Lomachenko is an active fighter who always throws a lot of punches, always puts his combinations together and is not afraid to be in a firefight when he thinks it suits him. So all in all, I think it's going to be a, a terrific fight and I'll be glued to the TV set like everyone else will. That fight is going to be on ESPN and available to a lot of people. And uh, uh, I think it's going to be, it's going to be fun. Um, now, the other uh, fight that's going to be fun is on October 31st when Leo Santa Cruz and Gervonta Davis uh, get into the ring. And uh, we had a chance to talk to Leo Santa Cruz. Here's our chat with Leo. Leo, this uh, match is an interesting one for so many reasons uh, between you and Tank Davis. One of them is the fact that it's for both the lightweight and, and uh, uh junior lightweight championship, super featherweight, if you will. And for you, you could become the first Mexican fighter to win titles in five different weight classes. That's got to be a, a pretty impressive thought for you to think you could be going for that. <laughs> yeah, no, of course it is. You know, I, ever since I started boxing, uh, I wanted to become world champion. That was my dream. Then my dream started getting bigger. And now that I have the chance to be a five-time, five-division world champion is something that I never imagined and I want to accomplish. You know, this is a big opportunity for me. So I'm going to go out there, give it my best, my all, and then, you know, fight for both titles the same night. And against fighter against Gervonta Davis is very for me. It's a big opportunity that I can, you know, let it pass. Now you, uh, you're going to go into this fight as the underdog, which is very rare for you. How does it feel to be the underdog yes. in a fight like this? <laughs> I know, you know, it feels, you know, a little bit um, weird. It's, you know, it sucks. But at the same time, you know, it motivates me more. It motivates me more because I'm going with that mentality that I want to go and show the world. I want to, that I deserve to fight him, that I'm at his level, that I could go out there and beat him, gain his third defeat. And because, you know, we asked for this fight. We were the ones that asked for this fight. We were the ones that wanted him. We wanted to fight big opponents, big names, and what better opponent than Gervonta Davis? 
And your dad, who of course is going to be in your corner, and and every many people know your dad has battled cancer, uh, and and recently con contracted COVID and got past that. And you said one of the reasons this fight is important is because your dad wanted it. He believed in you uh, to take this fight, didn't he? Yeah, of course. Yeah, my dad wanted this fight. He said, "Hey, you, you could beat Jermon Davis." You just gotta watch out for his power because he is strong. He does hit hard and he can knock you out if he catches you. But if you go out there and fight a smart fight, you could beat him. You have, you have longer reach, you have more experience. And with your experience and with you throwing punches, you could beat him. Is he the hardest puncher you faced? I would think he probably would be, although you don't know yet because you haven't been in the ring with him. But on paper, he seems to be, he's a true lightweight. He has to make the 130 to fight you, but it seems like he would be the hardest puncher you faced. We're going to be smart. We're going to go out there and try to fight a perfect fight because we know we have to fight a perfect fight to, to beat him, to not get caught, and that's what we're going to plan to do. Now, you if you take him into the later rounds, you've been yeah. 12 rounds nine times, and he's yeah. only been in the 12-round distance, actually never, but he got into yeah. the 12th round once. Do you think those later rounds, or the trick is to get there, of course, are those later rounds going to be rounds that you think you will own? Yeah, of course. You know, I think those are the later rounds I'm going to be able to, you know, take advantage of because uh, maybe Tank Davis is not used to it, so maybe he might be guessed out. And also with my pressure because, you know, with my pressure, no fighter likes a fighter being on top of you, throwing punches, pressuring you. I think that's even going to get even more so I think it's going to be more hard for him to go into the later rounds, so rounds, and we have the same energy. So I think I'm going to break down little by little, and he's going to be guessed out. So you think, and your work rate is a big part of that, isn't it, by, by being so busy? <laughs> yes, yeah, that's what I'm trying to do, you know, my work rate, staying on top of him, throwing a lot of punches. I don't think he's not going to know what to do. He's going to frustrate him. And he's going to guess out and, you know, put all his power out and he won't be able to make it out to a round. How um, uh, your height and reach, even though you're, com you're the fighter, you know, co uh, that is from lower weight class, you have a height and reach advantage on him. How important is that and how, how will you use that? Yeah, you know, it's very, it's very important for me, you know, to have the high reach because I know he has the power. I know he's shorter. So I think with my one, two, my jab, jab, keeping from the outside, not letting him come in, my, my punches are going to land first if I throw him first. So I just got to be smart, not, you know, not let him come in, throw those big power punches. And when he does, I'm just going to take steps back and just, you know, not let get hit. This is a pay-per-view. Uh, mm -hmm. You're headlining this pay-per-view. That has to yeah. feel like a big deal to you, huh? Yes, of course. You know, this is my first pay-per-view, me headlining it. That was my dream. So it's a dream come true. I'm going to go out there, try to become a superstar, you know, uh, show the world who Leo Santa Cruz is, and this is my time to shine. And that's what I'm going to try to do October 24th. You know, I, I was thinking uh, before we did this interview, you know, I've been announcing your fights for quite a while, and I think it started when you were, you know, in your early 20s. And you're 32 now, and I, you, it's, it's so weird because I think of you kind of frozen in age, you know, at 25 or something. Yes. How do you feel at 32? I know you're, you feel like a veteran, but do you feel fresh for, uh, for the, because you could, if you win this fight, you can still have some very big fights in the lightweight division. Yeah, of course. No, yeah, my body still feels great. You know, uh, I feel young. I still feel young. I, my body feels great. I feel strong. Speed, you know, everything is still there. I still have hunger since I began. Uh, I want to accomplish more things. And I think if I win this fight, I, there's other big fights out there for me. And I'm going to try to take advantage of them. Before I let you go, what is the one thing that Leo Santa Cruz can't do in this fight that you have to stay away from 100% uh, in order to win? Oh, we got a visitor. <laughs> yes, I, think, I think it cut off. Can you ask the question again? <laughs> yeah. What, uh, what is the one thing that... <laughs> Look at her. She's so cute. 
Um, what is the one thing <laughs> that uh, you can't do in this fight that you have to stay away from doing that would be the, the biggest problem? Oh, the one thing I can do is stay right there and brawl with him, you know, because I know we know he's, he's strong, he has power. And I can't stay there and like like I do with other fighters and, and do my defense like that because I know he's gonna he, that that's perfect for him you know that's what he wants he wants a fighter to stay right there like Jose Pedraza did he stood there and he was getting hit and that's how he knocked him out so I can't stay there I have to be moving all the time you know like uh, moving and not staying in there with him and exchange big power punches. That's great. And we got a little uh, example of it uh, uh, yeah. from your son back there. Hey, congratulations yeah. on this pay-per-view, um, Leo. And we look forward to seeing you in the ring against Tank Davis. You know, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Hopefully, you know, I go out there and give a great fight for the fans and I, I get the win. So, Leo Santa Cruz, uh, as he gets ready for his October 31st, matchup with Gervonta Davis, uh, as I said, a soft-spoken uh, gentleman uh, who is really a delight to be around. But once he gets in the ring, he's fists fly, and he throws sometimes over 100 punches per round. So we'll see how that all goes down on October 31st. Of course, I will be there announcing the fight with Mauro Ronaldo uh, and Abner Mars at ringside and our good friend Brian Custer. Um, uh, who, by the way, has, of course, has his own podcast, The Last Stand, which is part of our uh, our stable with uh, Let's Do Something Productions. And uh, uh, and uh, we'll all be there in uh, Texas to bring you the uh, the big pay-per-view. And I'm looking forward to it. Hey, Al, I, I want to make a confession. We are not saying that all Harvard students are drunk and unruly at boxing matches. It's mostly the MIT and the Brandeis kids are the right. bad ones. <laughs> Boy, am I glad you made that distinction. Right, because you know, we it would be uh, it would be wrong to just criticize the Harvard kids for that. <laughs> um now we we uh have, have formed a, a nice uh, partnership with uh, Tom Yankello and his World Class Boxing Channel uh and we urge you to go over and uh, check out uh that channel. Uh, because it, if you're an aspiring boxer and you uh, are getting involved in the sport, uh, take a look at it because he's got some great instructional videos. And even for those of you that are just boxing fans, the, the videos are not just instructional. They also are historical and they talk about how specific fighters uh, would deal with situations. Uh, and, uh, and Tom is uh, a very knowledgeable guy. So check uh, Check his and channel out. Al, he's going to work with me. I've got my new hockey season starts on Wednesday night. And I've gone oh for the past 14 years in hockey fights. I've got to win one before I retire. Uh, yeah. So Tom's going to help you with that, right? He is. Yeah. All right. Now, does he, is it, how hard is it to fight on skates? For me, it increasingly harder and harder, but he's <laughs> got some strategies for me. All right. Well, <laughs> Use the jab. That... I think that's a very sound move on your part to get some uh, some extra advice. Um, we uh, we know one thing that our one of our guests next week could fight on uh, canvas. That's for sure. Uh, Vinny Pazienza is going to be visiting with us on our next show, uh, and Vinny Paz is a, a colorful and fun guy. And as if that weren't enough, there's more. Uh, we also have Tim Ryan, the legendary. Uh, voice of boxing on CBS. Tim is uh, a great guy who I had the chance uh, to work with on a couple of different pay-per-views where he and Gil Clancy, of course, he and Gil Clancy were the team at CBS over years. Uh, my favorite announcing team of all time, probably. And when I worked with them, uh, Trip, you know, there were a couple of occasions where I had to sit in with them, and you know what it felt like? Somebody tapping Ginger Rogers on the shoulder when she was dancing with Fred Astaire and saying, <laughs> would you dance with me? It just didn't feel right to be there in that, in that mix, you know, and they were gracious, of course, but um, they were just, they had their own chemistry that was so special, so... Um, Anyway, it's so it's going to be fun. We're going to uh, visit with Vinny Pazienza and uh, Tim Ryan next week. And then in upcoming episodes, we have Damian Lillard, the great uh, uh, 
guard for the Portland Trailblazers, who is a huge boxing fan. He'll be joining us. And uh, so we got some fun folks uh, for, uh, for, you, for, for you to hear from on this uh, show. And we're very glad that you uh, joined us. So on behalf of Trip, uh, we will see you next time.